when we talk about healthcare, it's really important to remember that there's a moment in time where somebody gets diagnosed, where there's a clear before and after. I liken it to being struck by lightning because oftentimes a patient, a person has no idea what's coming. They don't remember the before until the after. And that can make it really hard to deal with whatever we're dealing with. I know this very well because as a person with type 1 diabetes, I felt like I got struck by lightning when I was diagnosed at the age of 14 because I was told it would be okay. All I needed to do was measure what I was eating and take my insulin and it would be fine. But the challenging thing is it's not that simple. For example, insulin, while you inject it, doesn't go into effect in your body straight away. It has a peak at about an hour and it can last into your body for several hours, which makes it really hard to know at any given time, is it working and it's just not time yet for it to peak? Or did it not work? Did I not inject successfully? Did my pump site fall out? Things like that. And it's also frustrating because there are things that make your blood sugar go up and things that make your blood sugar go down. And some of those things can make your blood sugar go up or down depending on the day and the time and some other combination of factors. It can be really, really hard to deal with it. And that's why it's really frustrating that even with some of the best tools, like an insulin pump or a continuous glucose monitor, those help, but that still makes living with diabetes really hard. These devices aren't perfect. An insulin pump by design is designed to give you the amount of insulin that you pre-program into it, which means that if your blood sugar goes low, the pump keeps pumping. It doesn't know that your blood sugar went low. And so by design, it's going to keep overdosing you with insulin unless you as the human take action. And the continuous glucose monitor that tells you what your blood sugar is every five minutes, that's really helpful. You don't have to finger stick dozens of times a day to find out what your blood sugar is. However, this device doesn't necessarily talk to the insulin pump. And this device relies on you hearing the alarm in order to do something about your changing glucose levels, which can make it really hard if, say, you're sleeping or you're working or the device is in another room or another bag. So if your brain gets used to hearing that same alarm over and over again, you can develop alert fatigue and no longer hear the alarm, whether you're awake or asleep. And that can be really dangerous and really scary. And it's really frustrating because even with these devices, you as a human still have to be the person connecting the dots between the data on the CGM, the actions that you've taken as a human, and what's going on with the insulin pump. So you're constantly having to make decisions over and over again, not once, not twice, not three times, but dozens of times a day. 24-7, 365 for the rest of your life. That's a lot. And so that's why it can leave a person with diabetes with graphs like this. This is my graph back in 2013 on a week where my doctor asked me to share my data. And I often share this picture for two reasons. Number one, this was a week where I knew I'd be sharing my data with my doctor. This was me trying my absolute hardest with a pump and a CGM and access to insulin. And yet this is what my graphs look like. And you can see the number of times I went high, then low, then high, then high, then low which left me feeling really bad and tired and just really frustrated because I was doing the best I possibly could with the tools that I had at hand. But the second reason I show this picture is you'll notice it's screenshots of a physical device that I then emailed to myself, copied and pasted into Microsoft Excel and printed out. This was how I was, as a patient, was able to get access to my data because I didn't have a PC. I had a Mac and the FDA approved software for my medical device said that I could only get my data off if I used a PC, which left me only being able to use my iPhone to take pictures of my data. So I was frustrated enough that I did call the manufacturers and ask for solutions. I said, hey, the system is great, but the alarm is not loud enough to wake me up at night. My brain is too used to the alarm. Can you make it louder? Can you make it different? Can I customize it? And the answer was everything from it's loud enough for most people to yeah, we're working on it. It'll be out in the next version. Fast forward many years later, they still haven't solved that problem. So instead of just staying frustrated or feeling out of control and powerless because I couldn't do anything with these devices, I decided to ask a different question, which was, if the device manufacturer won't change the device for me and I can't do it, what happens if we take the data from this device and then use a different solution to make a louder alarm by sending it to my phone? And at the time, again, I didn't have access to my data. I'm not an engineer. I don't work for these companies. I can't change this device. But what if I could take the data and use other devices like my iPhone to make a louder alarm. That would probably work. However, again, remember, I didn't have access to my data retrospectively, let alone in real time. But that all changed in later in 2013. I was lucky enough to stumble across a tweet from a gentleman named John Kostick. He has a son with type 1 diabetes, and he also struggled with how do I remotely access and monitor my son's data to make sure my son is okay. And 
he actually reverse engineered the software to pull the data off the physical receiver. And I reached out to him and said, hey, would you share your code with me? Would you help me do this? And he said, yes. And this absolutely changed my life because I was able to use this code to get the data from my CGM every five minutes, send it to Dropbox, to the cloud, and then down to my phone to use an app to make a louder alarm. It was absolutely life-changing because this loud, annoying alarm would actually wake me up at night if my blood sugar was too low or too high. And it was really powerful because we were able to start to add different things to the system once we freed the data from the device. We were not only able to alarm me if my blood sugar was already too low or too high, but we built a simple algorithm that would predict into the future, here's what's likely to happen and do proactive alerts and proactive alarms that would say, if you take action now, you'll prevent a high or low later. That was really powerful, even in an open loop setting where I was still enacting all the decisions. But because we shared what we learned and started talking with other people solving other problems around diabetes, we started to build a community of people who were also doing DIY, do-it-yourself diabetes. We ended up meeting another gentleman named Ben West, and he had spent years figuring out, how do I trust my insulin pump? When it says it's dosing insulin, how do I know what it's doing? And he actually figured out not only how to read the data from the pump, but also that there were commands to write or send a command to the insulin pump. And we gradually realized we actually have all the pieces we need to make a closed loop artificial pancreas system. Because what a closed loop is, is a computer instead of a human in the middle, where the computer can read the data every five minutes from the glucose monitor. It can read and write data from the insulin pump, run through the algorithm to decide what needs to happen and send a command back to the pump and say, adjust insulin delivery up or down. So that's what we did. You can see from the screen what it looks like. It's a standard insulin pump. It's a standard continuous glucose monitor and a small off-the-shelf piece of hardware that we were able to put a computer holding our algorithm in between the pump and the CGM. So instead of me as a human having to look at the CGM, look at the insulin pump and decide what to do, the computer every five minutes could look at that data, make those decisions and make small adjustments to insulin delivery over and over and over again. The computer doesn't get bored. The computer doesn't round. The computer doesn't go to sleep. The computer is able to do the job of being a pancreas so much better than I am. I can monitor not only my blood sugar levels, but exactly what my insulin pump is doing. And I can also communicate via my phone and tell the system if I'm gonna be doing anything out of the ordinary, like speaking or going for a run. And this is really, really helpful. It was absolutely life-changing for me. So we decided to open source this whole system and we call it Open APS, which stands for the Open Source Artificial Pancreas System. And the reason we did this is you can see from the graphs how hard it is to do manual diabetes. This was before I closed the loop with me trying my absolute hardest. And then you can see the difference. The first week I closed the loop, straight line after straight line after straight line. I got a lot of pushback early on from people who said, you're not a doctor or you're not an engineer. Why are you doing this? Why are you sharing this with other people? And it makes me so frustrated because if you don't live with diabetes or if you don't live with one of the chronic conditions, you don't realize how much self-management you have to do every single day for the rest of your life to just keep yourself alive. I do 99.9% of everything for diabetes is self-management. You have to engineer your solutions to figure out how to make your chronic disease management fit into your life. Everybody's different. And we have to constantly experiment because no one day is like the other. And so that's why traditional innovation is really challenging sometimes because a potential product for a solution isn't always solving the problem that we patients want it to solve. And oftentimes the solution is a product for just one aspect of the problem, but it's not fully solving the problem for everybody. And so as patients, we know we can't necessarily build those solutions for ourselves, or can we? Like the case of building a car, I don't know how to build a car, but I can look around and say, hey, here's some wood and some wheels. Let me make a skateboard because a skateboard will help me go from point A to point B a little bit more quickly. And the beauty of sharing what we do openly means that somebody else can come along and say, hey, I've got an idea of how to make this even better. In the case of a skateboard, it can be as simple as adding a steering configuration so that you can actually steer what you're doing and suddenly you have a scooter and that's more accessible for more people. And you iterate and you iterate and you iterate. And that's the beauty of open source is people can come together, talk about their problems and actually solve it for their real life. And that's why I think it's really important when we talk about healthcare, if you see somebody and you think, oh, that's just N equals one. Oh, they're an exception. Let's flip that question on its head and say, what if the 1% are not exceptions? What if they're the undiscovered rule? What if there's an entire huge portion of this population of people with diabetes or cystic fibrosis or cancer or whatever it is that we're talking about who have this shared problem and who could benefit from this shared solution? And what happens if we all work together? 
regardless of whether we're professionals in healthcare or professionals in our disease. We can absolutely work together and solve these problems and make our quality of life better. I'm not an engineer for my day job, but I learned how to code and program and put together these systems because I had to, and I had to try. And what was the worst? I went back to what I had before. So I think it's really important to say, let's try, let's try to figure it out. The second thing is realizing that anything is better than what we have. Anything is better than nothing. So we absolutely should try, but we shouldn't let perfection hold us back from getting started and having it a first solution. And the third thing is once you have a first solution, it doesn't have to be done. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can keep iterating. And oftentimes those small iterative changes become multiplicative instead of additive. For me, all I wanted was a louder alarm. First, I had to get my data. Then I could send it to my phone. And a lot of times anything is better than nothing for heading in the direction of thriving when living with diabetes or another chronic disease. And the third thing is recognizing that small iterative changes can often be multiplicative. Those small changes of getting my data off my device allowed me to build a louder alarm. That allowed me to build an algorithm that can predict blood sugars into the future. That allowed me to take that algorithm and put it on a computer to talk to my insulin pump. And that allowed me to build a closed loop artificial pancreas system. I didn't set out to build a closed loop artificial pancreas system but I made small iterations and those iterations really multiplied and added up to a life-changing system. So you may be wondering, how does this apply to you and your role in healthcare? Well, I think we all have something pressing facing us right now, which is COVID-19. You're probably working from home or staying at home as much as possible when you're not at work. We as individuals have a lot of power to impact and help save our communities from things like COVID-19. So back in February, we started asking ourselves, could we apply what we learned about open source from open APS and our experience in diabetes to doing something to help our communities with COVID-19. And we came up with an idea where we can use Bluetooth technology to anonymously trace interactions between two different mobile devices and allow people to anonymously track any symptoms that they have and push them to the cloud and alert anybody else if they've come in contact to somebody with symptoms that are concerning. And so we decided to create this as an app. We call it COEPI, which stands for Community Epidemiology in Action. And it's really about how do we empower us individuals to not only protect ourselves, but build a bubble of safety around small scale communities to help slow the spread of transmission of everything from COVID-19 to even colds and a flu. And how this app works is fairly simple. It has a code that's generated every 15 minutes. This is a randomized number that is not tied to you, but tied to your device, but it doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a profile. There's no picture. There's a secure number that changes every so often, up to every 15 minutes. And when your phone sees another phone, it uses your first random number to create what we call a temporary contact number. That temporary contact number is logged on the other phone in the app. Later, if you were to log symptoms, say you developed a cough, you might say, okay, I want to log a cough. It would push your symptom report of the cough along with your random number up into the cloud. The other Coepi apps or other compatible apps can pull down the symptom report that has the symptom report and that random number. And that random number will be used to regenerate the temporary contact numbers that that number saw. If there's a match on the local device, if your phone has that same temporary contact number, that exposure alert will be given to you to say, hey, you interacted with somebody who had a cough. And interacting with somebody with a cough or a runny nose, you maybe don't care about. But if you have a loved one in your family with cystic fibrosis or another immune condition, You might care more than an average person, or you may not, but the whole point of this is to empower individuals and allow you to have the power in your hands to cut down on transmitting illnesses before you get to the point of being symptomatic yourself or being very symptomatic with something like COVID-19. So that's really the idea of COEPI, is having this anonymous symptom sharing and alerting app and really taking those three core steps that we talked about and applying them to COVID. Again, you don't know what you can do until you try. There's a lot of things we can do to try to cut down on the spread of COVID-19. Number two, anything is better than nothing. We're all looking for ways that we can go back to work and go back to our communities and stop staying at home and stop social distancing while still protecting our communities. We are all passionate about healthcare. We are all passionate about helping other people. And so we have to recognize that just letting our communities die without taking action is not a choice for us. And so we can't wait for perfection. We have to work on all of these varieties of solutions and make them better as we go. And again, the third thing is small changes are iterative. This app isn't perfect. This app doesn't replace manual contact tracing, testing of COVID-19 and everything else, but it can be used as a leading indicator to show when symptoms are occurring in people and when transmission is starting to occur 
before we get to the point of people ending up in the hospital needing intense care for COVID-19. So I hope you ask yourself at the end of the day, what is it that we can do to solve COVID-19 or solve the problem that you're most passionate about in healthcare? And there's a phrase that we used when we started developing open APS and other DIY diabetes technologies to communicate how important it was because we felt at risk every single day. We said, we are not waiting. And I think a lot of us with COVID-19 and you yourself might be saying, we're not going to wait. We can't afford to wait to solve this problem, to solve these other problems. And if you're not already, I ask you to please join us in saying we are not waiting.